recording so welcome everyone also on Moodle and on YouTube uh, do you know that time yes so it's gonna be the 21st at 2 p.m. so it's more or less the standard lecture time so 2 in the afternoon um, uh, the exam will last I think 90 minutes um, but we'll have to see how it goes and how many questions I can come up with um, but it should be fine so just block it in your agenda, 21st of July, 2 p.m., our course exam. Will you do it online still? Yeah, I, I have to do it online. I'm not allowed to do it in person still. So, <clears throat> I am not from the Humboldt Uni, so do I need to register for the exam on Agnes 2? Well, if you're not from the Humboldt, you can't register via Agnes. I think you should mail the uh, Prüfungsbüro to be on the list because that's normally how I get it so I get a printed or I get a list where everyone has been like registered and then they add the people from external universities by hand so that's just handwritten on the thing so yeah just mail the Prüfungsbüro and they they will just put you on the list um, it might be that you get a hard time trying to get into contact with them um, it also took me like two weeks to set up the exam date um, but at least um, Jaja Potts is working, so you could s if you're if you get a like we're not in the office currently email back Tokoforol, then just send me an email and I can send you a, a internal email of one of the persons working there who is pretty quick in responding um, and not on holiday currently. So, all right. So, um, what about PhD students? Um, PhD students should be able to register via Agnes. Um, because you're a student, you should be able to log into Agnes. Um, I actually got my TAN code, so normally I could not log into Agnes because I don't, I don't have a student account. Um, but there's something new going on this semester where also teachers can register for Agnes and be able to log in and change some things. Um, but yeah, I, I think you should still be able to register. If you're trying to register on Agnes and you don't see it, then um, send me an email and also send the Prüfungsbüro an email that you want to register. Um, but as a PhD student, you theoretically don't need to do the exam. Although I do like people doing the exam because then I have an idea that I'm not giving you points for free. Um, so if, you, if you're a PhD student and you don't want to do the exam because you don't need the credits but you want to just have an attendance shine uh, that is also a possibility so some people for some people an attendance letter is enough um, and then the only thing that I do is just look through my administration who was there every lecture and if you attended I think 10 out of 13 or 10, 10 out of 14 lectures then you just get an attendance shine um, which for some studies is enough but that also depends on the study that you're following and if an attendance letter is good enough um, but just do the exam it's not that hard and it's fun um, because it's always after my birthday so there will be a birthday question which is a drawing question so that's one of the things that I can already tell you guys practice your drawing skills because drawing is I think an important part of biology because by drawing things it it kind of forces you to look at objects and to see differences. Sometimes you have to apply for a TAN list as a PhD student, it's just to click in Agnes. Also, yeah, yeah, so I got my TAN list as well because I'm now registered as a lecturer and as a lecturer I also need TANs to change stuff. Um, but I haven't logged in yet, so I, I, I will log in this week and then let you know next week because it might be that I actually that I might be able to register you guys on the exam as well. Um, so have, for example, Tokoforol being from an external university, it might be that I can put you on the list, um, but I have to check that. Um, but in theory, if you want to do the exam, um, then you can just send an email to the Prüfungsbüro and um, then they should fix that for you guys. So. Alright, any more questions about the exam? Um, I don't have a date for the re-exam yet, but I will start mailing again to get a date for the re-exam as well. Um, but I'm hoping that we don't have to do a re-exam because I'm hoping that everyone um, will just pass the first time around, which should be perfectly possible. That uh, I only had like, so I've been doing the course now for seven years. 
well, one can hope. How do you mean one can hope? Like I'm making the question, so it's up to me if everyone passes or not, right? Um, but uh, um, so far from the seven years that I've been doing it, only two out of seven years I had to give a re-exam. And generally that is someone who just failed to reach the 51%. So then they, they have like half of the questions or... I mean, it is difficult. Nah, the exam is not that difficult. At least, like, I never think it's difficult. And I've, like, it's a master course, but, or master slash PhD course, but I have bachelor students attending in the past who also were able to pass it. Um, so the, the questions are not too hard. Um, and of course, in the last lecture before the exam, I will also have some example questions so that you guys know how I ask my questions so that you don't get confused by um, these things. And generally, there's only like one or two trick questions in there. Like they're very straightforward questions, like just knowledge questions about R. Um, and then there's one or two trick questions. And there's always a birthday question so that you can make a nice drawing, impress me with your drawing skills, and then that's going to get you some extra points on the exam. Um, so if there's not any other questions, then I will take a sip of water because it's like sweltering hot here. Um, and then we will start with the assignments. Um, question to you guys, did everyone do the assignments? Since you now had two weeks to do them, um, that should have been more than enough time to get at least through the first couple of them. Um, I know they were hard. The, 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 the assignments this time were really hard. Um, and that is because making functions is one of the hardest things to do in R. Um, so I, I would say that in order of like difficulty, the the easier things are things like the type system, right? Is this a character and making a vector? And then have when you get to making matrices, it becomes a little bit harder. Um, then after that, you have like the for and the while loops, which generally are difficult. But once you practice them a couple of times and kind of get the feeling or get the and the finger spits and gefühl for it, um, then that's that's perfectly fine. But then functions are something that is always really hard. And um, if I look at, for example, the subreddit for R, then there's always questions about people that wrote a function that doesn't do exactly what they want it to. Um, so like writing functions is, is kind of the hardest part. And then of course, writing recursive functions is even harder. So, but I just wanted to show you guys that there is, um, and that you can use recursion to make really, really nice looking, nice looking functions. So um, if you did the assignments, just throw in chat how far you came. Like, I I'm not gonna be mad if you only did the first two. Um, although um, the one that I really like is actually one of the last ones. Um, so question number eight. That's one of my favorite questions because it's um, it, it brings out the crea creativity in people. So you can be really creative um, for um, um, drawing the tree and making it look really pretty. Oh, it's so hot, it's so hot. I hope you guys are watching on a phone and just sitting near a lake somewhere because that, that's what I would do. Anyway, let's start. So question number one. Um, Stream will start soon. No, we already started. So let me switch this one to the first one. Um, so this is what we will do today, but we will first do the assignments. So these are my answers to the assignments. Um, so assignment number one um, was uh, from Project Euler. Um, if you if you want to program something and you don't have something that you think, oh, I want to program this, right? Um, then Project Euler has some really, really nifty um, assignments, which go from like relatively easy to really, really hard. Um, and you can just work through them and it will help you check because it, you can check the answers, right? So it's a question and then you can fill in your answer and then it will tell you, well, this is the right answer. So you did everything correctly. Um, so the first three assignments are just taken from Project Euler um, because they have some really good assignments. So the first question is, if we list all the natural numbers below 10 that are multiples of 3 or 5, we get 3, 5, 6, and 9. Uh, the sum of these is uh, multiples is 23, right? So, and then the question was, find the sum of all multiples of 3 or 5 below 1,000. So and the first thing that you want to do is uh, make a vector um, like I did here. And I call this vector x3, and this will hold all the numbers which are... Um, 
well, multiples of 3 from 3 to 999, right? Because those are the numbers below. So I just say make a sequence from 3 to 999 and step by 3. So this is six, uh, 3, 6, 9, 12 and so forth. Um, then I do the same thing for x5. So um, I'm making a vector called x5 where I say make a sequence from 5 to 999 step by 5 every th time. And then there's two ways to then do the sum of these. Um, and here you have to realize that um, if you have these two vectors, then some of these numbers will be will be double, right? Because 15 is divisible by 3, uh, but it's also divisible by 5. So you have to get rid of the duplicates. So there's two ways, and there's a hard way, and there's an easy way. So let's first look at the easy way. So the thing that I'm going to do is I'm just going to combine these two vectors into one big vector. So this will have first all of the multiples of 3, and then it will have all of the multiples of 5 in there. And then I'm just going to combine these two using the C function, and then I'm just going to ask for the unique values. And the unique function is a built-in function in R, um, which will get rid of all the duplicate values. So if you have 15 in there twice, then it will only have 15 in there once after you did unique. Um, and then you just take the sum. And that this will give you the sum of all the values from 0 to 999, which are divisible by 3 or by 5. You can also do it yourself, right? So instead of using the unique function, you can also do a, um, a, a a minus, right, so throwing away some numbers. Um, so the thing that I'm doing here is I'm from x3 I'm going to remove all of the numbers which are also in x5, right, because by removing the duplicates or the numbers from x3 that are also in x5 I am left with a set of numbers which doesn't contain any duplicates. So what I'm going to do is say, well, which of the x3 numbers are located in x5 and then remove them, so minus, remove them from x3, right? So to, to unpack this a little bit, um, yeah, because this is the kind of core of it, so I'm going to say, well, yeah, do a, a which, so which numbers of x, x3 are in x5, and then remove them from x3. So I'm just going to index x3 by using the index brackets, and then saying minus which x3 and x5, and that throws them away. And then I'm going to combine this together with x5, and now because there are no duplicates, right, because every number from x5, which was also in x3, is not there anymore, I can then just combine them and then sum them up. All right, so let's go to R and throw it in and see what the answer is. And of course, these should both give the exact same answer. Um, so we can see that the sum of all of these numbers, which are divisible by 3 or by 5, is uh, 233,168. And if we use the unique function, we get the exact same answer. So that means that we did, we did the correct thing. All right, so the next question, oh, that's the wrong window. Um, so the next question is a little bit harder. Um, but I like this a lot because I love the Fibonacci sequence and I love a lot of things about like sequences that are repeating um, and the Fibonacci sequence comes back in a lot of things related to biology but also to genetics. Um, yeah, because the Fibonacci sequence is, and so each new term in the Fibonacci sequence is generated by adding the previous two terms um, by starting with one and two, the first ten terms will be. Right, so um, I don't have this window here. So I can't show you the assignments, but I'm guessing that you have the assignments uh, there, right? So the Fibonacci sequence for the first 10 terms goes 1, 2, and then the next number is the sum of the first two, so it's 1 plus 2, which means 3, and then the next number is then 3 plus 2, so that's 5, and then the next number is, of course, 5 plus 3, which is 8, and then the next number is 13, which is then 8 plus 5, and so forth, right? So the, the number that you do um, is, um, and so the, the next number in the row um, you can find by taking the previous two numbers and adding them together. Um, so by considering the terms in the Fibonacci sequence whose values do not exceed a million, find the sum of the even value terms, right? So this is a, this is a very layered um, question, right? Because you have to read the question very carefully. So hey, the first thing that we need is to be able to generate Fibonacci numbers, right? And after we are able to generate Fibonacci numbers, 
we want to generate Fibonacci numbers which are below a million and we then want to do a sum so we want to add every number together when the number is even and not the odd number so we're leaving out the odd numbers so the first part of course is to find a um, is to find a number um, head uh, so to find a, a function which calculates our Fibonacci numbers and fortunately because of recursion we can write this version or we can write this function very easily right because we have a Fibonacci sequence and the Fibonacci sequence has two initializers, right? Because there are two base cases to the recursion. And that is, if I ask you for the first Fibonacci number, you know that the first Fibonacci number is one, right? That's, that's in the assignment. The second Fibonacci number is two, because that's in the assignment. So these are our two base cases. So when I'm asking, so I'm creating a function in called x, right? And x is the nth Fibonacci number that we want to get. So if x is 1, then we want to have the first Fibonacci number, so we just return 1. When x equals 2, we want to have the second Fibonacci number, so we just return 2. And then if we want to have Fibonacci number 3, then what do we do? So Fibonacci number 3, we can calculate Fibonacci number 3 by taking the Fibonacci number of 2, so x minus 1, so 3 minus 1, plus the Fibonacci number of 3 minus 2. And this is the whole function. So you see here that the recursion very neatly describes the structure of the Fibonacci sequence, right? If I want to have the Fibonacci of x, take the Fibonacci of the of the previous one, so the previous x, so x minus 1, and the one before that, which is x minus 2. All right, so this is my function to compute Fibonacci numbers. And then, of course, I need to test it because I want to make sure that, like, I throw in the first six Fibonacci numbers um, just to make sure that the numbers that come out of the function match the numbers that are in the assignment. So let's load this function in R and just generate the first six Fibonacci numbers and see if this is what we kind of expect and hey, what it, if it is the same as in the assignment. Um, yeah, so we go to R, we take our Fibonacci, so the Fibonacci number of 1, so the first Fibonacci number is 1, the second one is 2, the third one is 3, and then the fourth one is 5, five the fifth one is 8, and the sixth one is 13. And of course we could check the tenth one as well, so we can just say Fibonacci of 10, and then of course the tenth one is 89, and then if we look at the assignments, then this, this matches up with the list that we saw in the assignment. So that that's the function that we want to make um, and I hope that everyone was able to make this function because it is it takes a little bit of thinking work but you can see here that the way that you write it down is very close to the mathematical definition of Fibonacci right because the the next Fibonacci number is made by summing up the previous two so that's x minus 1 and x minus 2 and of course that's why we have two base cases as well so what's someone able to come up with this or did we all just hang out in the sun and didn't do the assignment but like I'm not like it, this is hard this is really really hard so hey this is only question two um, so the questions will become a little bit harder but hey, for this you have to be able to understand the Fibonacci sequence hey you have to recognize that there is a, a perfect recursion here right because the third number is the sum of the second and the first and the fifth number is the sum of the fourth number and the third number and so this recurses always back to the first two numbers um, so that's the first part right so to have a function which generates Fibonacci numbers for you then we can look at my answers and then yeah yeah I'm already recording so um, at least I hope so. Yeah, no, I'm recording 19 minutes now. So this 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 is this is getting recorded. Yeah. We are we are live and recording. Like for the people on YouTube, right? You know that. Um, so then the second part of the assignment, right? So the second part of the assignment is to generate all of the Fibonacci numbers which are smaller than a million. And then if they are even, we want to sum them up. Right, so so we want to keep track of, for example, the the yeah, so we want to sum up all the even Fibonacci numbers while they are smaller than a million. So I have this this big 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 piece of code for this, and this is just 
the way that it is because in this case we don't know when the Fibonacci numbers will be above a million so we can't use a for loop because we have no idea where the boundaries are of our system right so and it, it's not that we can go from one to the number of rows in a certain column because we have no idea when the first Fibonacci number that we that we calculate will be higher than a million so we have to do a while loop and doing a while loop is harder than doing a for loop because we have to keep track of our own index right so that's the first thing that I do so I define X so X is our index counter so X means the the and so um, the nth Fibonacci number right then I define something which is called fipsum filthy casual thank you for following uh, I'm so sorry I, I didn't put the desktop audio on so you missed the sound effect Let, let's do a sound effect as well so <laughs> all right um, so we, we take another variable to keep track of our sum so these this will contain all of the numbers that we have summed up so far right so the first thing that we are going to do is uh, or the besides that so we have our nth Fibonacci number which X is tr keeping track of then we have the FIP sum which is the sum of all the even Fibonacci numbers and then we of course need to calculate the Fibonacci number so I'm just going to say FIB X because we need to test if this number is even or if it's odd right so I'm just going to calculate it and store it before we start the while loop because I know the Fibonacci number of one is one so I could have just initialized it by one doing it like this right but I think it's cleaner to do just say fib x because then we're using the nth Fibonacci number variable that we declared right so we need three variables to kind of keep track of the state where we currently are so then what are we going to do so we're going to say while the Fibonacci number variable is smaller than a million what am I going to do well I'm going to check if the Fibonacci number is even right and we already saw this in like one of the first assignments so to check if a number of e number is even we can look at the remainder after dividing it by two right so if I divide a number by two using Euclidean division if there is no remainder that means that the number is divisible by two without any remainder which means that the number is even if I wanted to sum all of the odd numbers so not the even numbers then I would have just said one right because if I Euclidean divide a number by two and there is a remainder then the remainder is always one of course and then it means that the number is odd right because three Euclidean division by by two is one remaining um, but in this case we want to sum up the even numbers so we just test if the Fibonacci number is device or Euclidean divisible by two without having any remainder and if this is the case then the number is even so if the number is even what do we do well I'm going to print the X right because I might be interested to kind of keep track of the algorithm while it's running um, just to make sure that I don't end up in an infinite loop and but I'm going to say well X I'm going to print so the nth Fibonacci number then I'm doing a space and then I'm printing the Fibonacci number that I just calculated and then I do a new line of course because I now know that the number is even what I can do is I can take the number and add it to the Fibonacci sum that we are keeping um, Mustafa Mustafa Kang Sank. thank you for following um, so here I'm just going to add the Fibonacci number to the Fibonacci sum and then storing it in the Fibonacci sum so that is that is kind of the way that we are doing it right and this is very common this is a very common paradigm to do in R is to define a variable which is keeping track of our running sum um, of course no matter if the number is even or odd I have to go to the next Fibonacci number so I'm going to increase X by one so go from the first one to the second one and then of course I'm going to just say well I'm now having to update the Fibonacci number as well so I'm going to call our function called FIP with the new number and then I'm going to update the Fibonacci number and this will go through all of them and it will stop when the Fibonacci number is not smaller than a million 
And then of course at the end, so when we are done, right, then we have summed everything up and then I want to know what the sum is of all of these even Fibonacci numbers. And then I just type vipsum in R because that is the thing that is holding our summation. So that's it. Um, big piece of code, um, very difficult because we have the three variables that we need to keep track of. So X is the, the, the index, the nth Fibonacci number. Vipsum is keeping our sum and num is keeping our current Fibonacci number. So let's run this in R. It will take a little bit of time. It, not, not that much, but it will take a little bit of time because it has to calculate Fibonacci numbers using recursion. Um, and although recursion is fast, um, it, it does have to go through all of them. So let's do that. So we see that the, the second Fibonacci number is an even number. It's two, we knew that already. The fifth Fibonacci number is also even because it's eight. The eighth Fibonacci number is also even. And then we end up with the last one, the 29th Fibonacci number, which is 800 and, uh, 832,040. And this is also an even number, right? So, and if we add all of these numbers, together, then we get the value of 1,089,154. Um, so that was the answer. Is this clear? Are there any questions about how you should calculate it? Did anyone calculate it in a different way? Um, did anyone make a Fibonacci function which doesn't use recursion? because there are options to do that, um, but they are generally more complex because you have to keep track of state yourself, right? Because now the nice thing is, is that the number goes into the stack, right? By calling the function with a number lower, hey, you get this automatic expansion in a way, um, but you can do it with a for loop or with a while loop as well. So, but um, this is kind of the way that I did it. So if you have any suggestions on how you would have want to do it differently, then let me know and we can, we can talk about the other ways of answering it. All right, number three. So number three is one of my favorite because I love polyndromes. And I don't just love polyndromes, but they are actually very important in genetics because all of the, or most of the things that define if DNA is being transcribed or if a protein binds there um, that is generally based on a polyndromic sequence and that is that because a lot of proteins they come in two right so you have two times uh, two similar proteins which bind each other and then they bind to the DNA um, but because there are two similar proteins you generally see that the, the sequence that they bind is for example TCA ACT because the two proteins come together and then bind the DNA. So finding palindromes is something which is, is, is done a lot in biology. So there's a lot of very smart algorithms to find palindromes as quickly as possible. Um, but of course, a palindrome is just a number um, or is a, is, a, is a word that when reading from the front to the back is the same as when reading it from the back to the front. So a question to anyone who's in chat you can throw in your favorite palindrome or the longest palindrome that you know and I will participate. So the longest palindrome that I, or the palindrome that I like the most is of course this one, um, which if you read it from the front, it is the same when you read it from the back. So how do we check in R if a number is a palindrome? Well, Again, there are multiple ways of doing this. One of them is just Googling, right? And saying, give me a package, which allows me to test if something is a palindrome, which is kind of okay, but it's kind of cheaty, right? Because we do want to write these things ourselves. Um, but this is how I did it. So I make a function again, because him making functions is um, the way to make code, which you can reuse later on. Right? In, in theory, once I've wrote the Fibonacci function, then from now on, every time in the future, in like five years time, if I need Fibonacci numbers, I can just use this little piece of code again. Right? So I have, don't have to rewrite it. I can just store it in a library, um, in a package. And then next time that I need it, I can just call the function and it will just be there. Um, so I do the same thing for palindrome. So I first write a function to check if something is a palindrome. Right, so I call this function is palindrome. So this will tell me if a number is a, or a number or a character string is a palindrome. So it is of course a function which takes a variable as input. So the variable input I call my str for my string, so or input string. So what I do is of course the, the easiest way is just to take the string and to revert it, right? To just flip it around. 
And we already learned that there is a ref function in R which can reverse a, a vector. But of course, a string is not a vector. So the first thing that we need to do, and of course I'm going to read this from the inside out again, is first thing that we're going to do is the, the input string, I'm going to split it. And I'm going to split it every character. And that is what this means. So I'm going to split it using an empty string. So that means that if I have a vector, um, well, we can just do that in R, right? So in R, I can show you how this works. So if I have, for example, a vector, like something like this, right? So my str, and if I now do a string split on this, and I split it by nothing, then you see that it will now create a vector, which has a length of four, which is the individual letters. And that is what you can do by using this kind of empty string. So splitting something by an empty string means that it just takes the letters apart from each other. The thing is, is that string split doesn't know how many things you're going to input, right? So that's why it gives you back a list. And in this case, it's a list of length one um, because I only inputted one string. But of course I could have done multiple strings, right? So I could have done um, two strings together. Um, something like this, right? And now if I would do a string split, then it would give me back a list with two. On the first, it will split the first one, and on the second, it will split the second one. So that is why when I go to Notepad++, I do the string split of my string using nothing, and then I always take the first element because my is palindrome function will only test the first element in, in or will only test a, a single string value. Right? And even though I could give it a list of strings, I don't want to deal with that. I just want to do the first one. Right? So if I input a vector which has two strings in there, I'm just going to check the first one and not the second one. And so I could write that in the function or in the, in the, in the, in the comment here. Um, but so what I do is I take the first element and then I just reverse it. So now I take the, the character vector and I just flip the character vector. So instead of reading it from front to back, I'm going to read it from back to front. So just reversing it. Then of course, I want to compare this back to the original input. So the thing that I have to do then is put the things together again, because I just took every letter apart to be able to use the reverse function. But now I have to kind of glue them all together again. So gluing them all together is you can do using the paste function. So I'm going to say paste the inverted string or the reversed string that was the input and then collapse them with nothing right so and what this will do it will just glue the whole vector together into a single string um, and then I call this ref my string so this is the reverse of my string and then of course when something is a palindrome then of course the reverse str string should be equal to the input is that clear because that, that, I, that I take it apart into individual letters, I flip all of the letters around, and then I paste them back together, having a single string, and then compare this new string, the reverse, to the original. And if the reverse matches the original, then something is a palindrome. And again, I, I test it, right? Because I then call the function using something that I know is a palindrome and something which I know is not a palindrome. All right, so let's go to R. Let's show you guys that this really works. Um, and then, of course, we can call it with a couple of other palindromes. Unfortunately, no one has put their favorite palindrome in chat, so I will just use my favorite palindrome. So um, this is, of course, a palindrome. So, and there's many, many different palindromes. But palindromes come back everywhere in biology and in genetics, so it's important to be able to have like a little function like this. I know that that's your favorite. It's also my favorite. My moderator wasn't paying attention to what I said in chat, so, but it doesn't matter. Um, but my favorite palindrome, also her favorite palindrome, so it works. So you can see that indeed it's a palindrome. And we could test a couple more to make sure that it had functions for all kinds of different input. Of course, um, if you input a vector, right, which is of length two, it will only use the first one. So um, if I would do something like this, um, then it should, still, it, it, it should say true and false. But of course, the second one is not to be trusted because in my function, I just take the first one. So that's, uh, don't, don't be sorry that you're late. We're happy that you're here. So, 
Okay, so now we have a function that checks palindromes. And now we can start with the real assignment, right? Because the real assignment was something that, uh, that, that, is, that is overly complex. So, but he, a palindromic number reads the same both ways. The largest palindrome made from the product, so the multiplication of two, di two, two digit numbers is 900, uh, 9009. Yeah, because if I multiply 91 with nine, uh, 99, then I get 9009 as the, as the result. And now the question here is, find the largest palindrome made from the product of two three-digit numbers. So do the same thing, but now for two-digit numbers, do it now for three-digit numbers. So now again, I have to start remembering a whole bunch of things. So I'm going to... Um, have again three variables which will just help me to kind of or help the, the the r function or the r thing to remember some of these things that i have so i have xi which will be the first three digit number right then i have yi which is the second three digit number and then i have something called big so far and this is the biggest palindrome yet, right? Because I'm just going to start at the bottom and I'm just going to brute force my way through. So I'm going to first say 100 times 100. Is the output of that a palindrome? Then I'm going to do 100 times 101. Is that a palindrome? Then I'm going to do 100 times 102. Is that a palindrome, right? So I'm just going to test everything. So I need to remember the biggest palindrome that I have seen so far. So the big so far is the biggest palindrome that I've seen so far. And then we're just going to start looping. So I'm going to say 4x in 100 to 999, right? Because those are all three digit numbers. And then I'm going to say 4y, so that's the second number, in x to 999. And why am I using x here and not just 100? Because I could have just done 100. Because of course, 100 times 101 is the same as 101 times 100, right? So when I have calculated 100 times 101, I don't have to do the opposite, right? So, and here I'm doing, so I'm, I'm using the first number, so I'm doing 100 times 101, 100 times 102, all the way up to 999. But then when I do 101, then I'm not doing 101 times 100. I'm doing 101 times 101 because that's where I start then. So that allows me to, to not duplicate something that I already did. But both, both approaches are perfectly valid. So we can just say 4y in 100 to 999, but this will of course calculate duplicates, right? So 100 times 101, but also 101 times 100. So to prevent that, we can say that x or that y starts only at x. So just to kind of half the work that we're going to do. And then, of course, the thing that I'm going to do is just say, well, I'm going to multiply x and y and then make a character out of it and then use my function. So if something is a palindrome and the multiplication is larger than the largest number that I have seen so far, then this is my new top candidate, right? And then I just remember it, so I'm saying big so far is x times y, I'm remembering x in xy, and I'm remembering y in yi, and then I'm just going to cut it because I just want to keep track of the algorithm, so I'm just wanting to see kind of how it runs through all of the numbers and comes up with the biggest palindrome so far. And of course, then I'm just going to close all of the brackets because that's the only thing that I have to do. And then in the end, I can print big so far, which is of course the, the largest palindrome made out of three digit numbers. I'm going to print xy and yy to know which two numbers I have to multiply together to get the biggest palindrome so far. All right, so let's run this because this will, this will run a little bit because it's a brute force and we're going to do a couple of thousands combinations and perhaps even a million combinations. So it will take a little bit of time. Um, but the nice thing is, is that because of the cut statement, we will have continuous feedback of the algorithm, what it is doing and how far it is, um, which is nice, right? All right, so let's just run it. 
So we see that when we are at 101, we are actually calculating a lot of palindromes. Um, and we can see that the, the number is actually growing because I'm only printing a new combination when the combination is bigger. Um, so after running the algorithm, we know that the biggest palindrome that you can make of two three-digit numbers is 906609, which is indeed a palindrome. And we can make this number by saying I'm taking 913 and I'm multiplying that by 993. It's magic. It's not magic. It's just mathematics with a little bit of like logical sense in there. Um, but this, does this make sense to you guys? Or do you say like, I don't understand anything of this. Like what he's talking now is complete Chinese. Um, yeah, but the thing is, is that in, in programming, generally you use variables, right, to remember things for you. So I, I up front, I'm just going to say, OK, so if I would do this by hand, I would do 100 times 100. And then I would check then the output to see if it's a palindrome. Then I do 100 times 101, see if it's a palindrome. If yes, then I would write the number down. And I would just do all of the multiplications until I reach like the largest one. And so defining some variables up front to kind of keep track of the things that you want to keep track of. Then you just brute force through the entire problem space. And here I'm having our problem space, but I could have said just go from 100 as well. Um, and then check if it is a palindrome. If it is bigger than the biggest thing that I've seen so far, then I'm just going to remember it. And I'm just going to give myself some feedback so that when I'm running the algorithm, that I'm not, and that I'm not stuck, that it's not an infinite loop. And that's one of these important things. If you write like while loops, especially, make sure that you always put in a cut statement. Because if it starts hitting an infinite loop, um, then of course you can see that because you get the same output over and over again in your screen. All right. So these were relatively hard, but these are really good things to kind of practice on for like half a, like half a weekend. Right. If you are not doing anything on, on Saturday and it's like sweltering hot outside, then hey, you close all of the curtains and you just sit inside and have your Dyson Airblade or some other like fancy machine that cools you down and uh, just sit behind the computer and do something that kind of relaxes your mind and uh, think about and, and try to make, um, try to come up with an algorithm like this. Miko, yeah, you, you want to have your Miko fan. So I'm just going to promote your Miko fan as well. Buy a Miko fan. They actually are the number one in the German, um, what's it called? The, the German thing, the, the, the guys that test all of the different projects. And they, they're not that expensive either. And with like having 36 degrees outside, it's nice to have a fan. I wish I would have a fan in my office, but unfortunately I do not. OK, so if this is clear, right, so make a little function and then use the function to kind of calculate what you want um, and then hit answer your question. Ah, the Stichtung Waren test or a constant ice cream supply. I hope that you have a constant ice cream supply, General Gulak. I really, really hope that you do that. Um, if I would be you guys, I would be sitting in a park underneath a tree with like a fan in front of me and like a laptop on my lap and just watching it like that. Uh, unfortunately, I can. All right. So um, the next question was a, a relatively simple question because this one was already given or half of it was uh, lemonade. Lemonade. Mm, that's a good thing. I just have water, but at least I have enough water to get me through this three hour of lecture. So, uh, But uh, the next question, question number four was to make the count down function also work for counting up. So, and in this case, it, it I think it's relatively simple if you look at the assign or at the lecture, because in the lecture we we started from a hundred and then counted down to to one. Um, but in this case, we also want to count up. So if someone fills in a negative number, and then based on the number, we want to then go up to zero. And then once once we're at zero, then everything is fine. Um, and we just finish. So again, yeah, because it's a recursive function, we want to call the function itself. But first, we define our function as a function called countdown, which takes a number. And x is our number that we are going to start off with. So if x is zero, then we are finished. So this is our base case of the recursion. 
right? And x will be our recursion invariant. So the base case of our recursion is when we are at zero, then we are finished. If x is larger than zero, then we are going to say cut the count with the current value, and then we're going to call the same function again, but now we make x one smaller, right? Because the number was higher than zero, so to go to zero, we have to subtract one. Of course, if x, hey, the second case is that x is smaller than zero, so if x is smaller than zero, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to cut the number, just like we did before, and then we're going to say, well, call the countdown function now with x plus one. And of course, we always wanted to do the count, right? So we could have here have a, a slightly different structure, but had to kind of, re because this is a duplicate line. So duplicate lines of code are always highly suspicious because generally you can work them out of the if statement. But we're not going to do that. We're just going to be like lazy and just going to do forward programming. So we're going to say, no, if x is larger than zero, I'm going to print the number and I'm calling, going to call the same function again, but now the number is with a number one smaller and if x is lower than zero I'm going to do the same thing so print the number but now I'm going to call the countdown function with a number which is one higher because we want to count up to zero or we want to go down to zero. All right and that's it so let's count down from a hundred and then count down or kind of count up from a hundred or minus a hundred um, which is a little bit confusing. So of course the, the first one will just count down and the other one will just count up and every time that we hit zero it will say countdown finished. So that was, that was kind of the easiest way of doing this. Um, and very similar to what we saw in the, uh, in, in the lecture, right? Because in the lecture we already had the countdown function counting down from 100 to zero but it would error out on negative numbers and in this case we don't want an error on negative numbers but on negative numbers we want to just go the other way. All right, so question number five. So question number five is interesting because there are very, very different ways of answering it. And in the last couple of years, I have had um, like a couple of different versions that people have submitted for answer to number five. But the way that I first did it is just the lazy function, right? So the, the question was, let me read the question for you guys. Um, so number five is write your own version of L apply. Make sure to check that the input is a list and throw an error using the stop function if it is not a list. The function signature should look like, and then this is the function signature, um, which we see here. Um, so that was a given. Um, and then you should implement the function. So the easiest way to implement the L apply function is just to call the L apply function, right? So I'm going to say, create a function called my l apply which is a function that takes x as input then it takes the function that i want to apply to each element of x and then i just want to do dot 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 right because people might give more parameters of course there was this um, one sentence which says that um, if the input is not a list throw an error so that's what i'm going to do so if not is list x stop x must be a list Right, so this is my, my own um, kind of addition. And then, because I'm going to be very lazy, I'm just going to return the L apply of X of the function using the dots. So I'm just gonna call the L apply function, right? Which is kind of cheaty, but it's, it's a very lazy way of doing it. And it actually works. So um, that's what I kind of thought would be okay. And I would be okay with that, right? Like, it, like being smart and just using something which is already in the standard library is not bad, right? You don't have to program everything yourself. Um, then there was actually someone called Marlon in one of the earlier lectures who came up with this version. Um, so I'm just gonna show you, I'm not gonna explain to you how it works, but it's the same thing, right? Because he just says, if is list x is false, Right, which is also a valid way. You don't have to use the, the, the not command. You can also say if is list x is false, stop, this is not a list. And then what he did was kind of sneaky because he kind of used the function. So his version only works for functions um, which, um, which do not, uh, which, where the function actually supports a list as input. So he just says return, call the function with x, and then do the dot 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 parameters inside of the function. 
So this works for things like sum and for um, mean um, and these kinds of things. So pretty smart function as well because just calling the function and assuming that the function supports a list um, is also a valid method. Of course this doesn't work for functions that don't support lists as input. Of course there's also the, the version that I wanted you guys to write more or less because this is the, the non cheaty version right because you're not using the lapply function um, so I'm just going to use the signature as given so I'm going to say my lapply is a function which takes a a list called x it then takes a function that needs to be applied to each element of the list and then we have dot 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 and dot 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 here is the parameters to the function so what do we do well if not is a list x stop right so that doesn't change we have to first test if x is a list and then I'm going to do say well I'm now going to make an empty list right so I'm going to make something called res which is the result so result will 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 store for each element the, the function applied to the element of x right so and the thing is is that in our weirdness making a list requires you to use the vector function which I never understood but it's just the way that it is so if I want to make an empty list which I'm going to do I'm going to have to say well give me a vector which is a list type and then make space for this number of elements so this number of elements is the length of x right because if the input of x is a list length 20 then I need to have the result also a list length 20 if the input is 1500 long then the result also should be 1500 long and then I'm just going to go through x right so I'm going to say for i which is the index in 1 to the length of x what am I going to do well I'm going to store in the ith result right so in the nth result I'm going to store what am I going to store well I'm going to store the function called on the ith element of x and then I'm going to use the dot 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 so the variadic parameters are going to be given to this function and because I'm using a for loop this will just go through each of the elements of the input apply the function to it and then store the result in, in res and then of course since I'm inside of a function I need to return something so of course I'm going to return the result so that's also a way to do it so hey you can just be lazy and call the built-in lapply function you can be like Marlon and just say well no I assume that my function that I'm calling a supports list or I'm going to use a for loop and be very very explicit about it and just do one by one so um, that's the way that I did it okay so um, let, let's run this version in R so to just show you guys that it does the exact same thing as the built-in lapply function of course the built-in lapply function has some um, additional advantages of being like memory efficient and not using a for loop um, but and so this is what is going to happen so when I use the real lapply function which is built into R so I take a list of 1 2 3 4 5 6 and I'm going to apply the sum function to it which going not going to do anything right because the sum of 1 is 1 the sum of 2 is 2 the sum of 3 is 3 right so in the end I'm just going to get back the numbers that I input it um, and the same thing for my lapply function I am going to give it the list of 1 2 3 4 5 6 and I'm going to apply the sum function to each of these elements and of course I'm just summing up a single number so the number will be the same as the input but at least it works and you can see that the output of the my implemented version is the same as the lapply function um, I did like the cheaty version very much when someone came up with it um, just using like I when I made the question I wasn't thinking about someone just using um, the, the lapply function sometimes it's fun to see people kind of looking at your questions and then doing their best to kind of exploit it in a way so that they don't have to do too much thinking um, but it's very creative and I like creative solutions to, to answers all right question number six um, so this is just to show you how this variadic argument thing works right so variadic arguments are very very powerful because it allows you to have as many input parameters into your function as you want and you can actually do things with it so um, how does this function work well I'm calling um, I'm creating a new function called my dots which is a function which takes an, a, a variable number of arguments as input 
So what am I, what is it going to do? Well, it's going to take these variable arguments and put them in a list. And I'm going to call this params. So these are the input parameters to the function. And then I'm just going to go through all of the input parameters and I'm going to write them out to the screen. So I'm just going to say for i in one to the length of the parameters. What do I'm going to do? Well, I'm going to cut. I'm going to take the names of the parameters i. Malilenka, thank you for following. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, is the sound not too loud though for following? I hope not, but uh, for me it's not, but I can't hear what you guys are hearing, so it might blow up your speaker, but I think it's okay. I didn't change it too much from last time, but I had an update, so, um, or the, the OBS, so the capturing software that I'm using had an update, so it might be that it just blew up the sound again. But for i in 1 to the length of the parameters, I'm just going to say cut, take the names of the parameters, so the ith one, and then say is parameters i, right? And here the thing is, is that the names of the parameters are a vector, so I can use the single square bracket, while the parameters themselves are a list, right? So I have to use the double square bracket here to get the, the number one, number two, number three from the list. And that is just because lists in R, um, you have to use this double, double square bracket thing. So, of course, this then is a function, so I'm just going to not return anything from this function. Um, but when I call this function using a equals 10 and xx equals 4, then of course it should print this to the screen. Um, so let's show you guys how this works in R. Um, so if we go to R and we just do our function, then hey, when I do my dots a equals 10, xx equals 14, then it will say a is 10, xx is 14. And it will also work when parameters are unnamed, so I can do something like my dots 10 comma x, and then it will just say, well, there's a, a variable which has been given to my function, which does not have a name, but has the value of 10. And of course, hey, that this could be multiple, so hey, you can also have like 15, so now it will say there are two parameters which have been passed to the function, which do not have a name, one with the value 10, one with the value 15, and then we have a variable which is named xx, which has the value of 14. So using variadic arguments, uh, we can accept any number of input parameters to the function, even zero. So hey, if I wouldn't do anything, then of course it would give me an error because I didn't check that there, are, that there is at least one, right? The, the function just assumes that there is one because it goes from one to the length. Um, but yeah, so there have to, if I want to kind of fix this error, then I just have to check that there is at least one element in params. Um, but yeah, so in theory I could make it work, but since I always assume that there is one parameter, it gives me an error and a subscript out of bound. So it, because I'm trying to access params i, which does not exist, there is no parameter. All right, so was this everything? Yes, this was everything, because the second two questions are additional questions, so the answers you can find on Moodle. Um, I just want to show you question number eight, because I spend a lot of time making this thing look good. And it's drawing a tree using a recursion. And this is very close to things like fractals. Um, so I, I found this a really, really fun thing. And it's already three, but I, I just want to show you guys quickly um, what you can do with it and that you can make stuff look really, really pretty in R um, if you spend some time on it. Um, so let me show you how I did it. And this is, oh, um, so uh, uh, that one. Good. So um, I prettified it with color. So this was my first most basic try. So I just have a draw tree function, right? And the draw tree function takes a whole bunch of parameters. So it takes an X position and a Y position. So this is the starting point of my tree. Then it has an angle, which is the, the angle of the line that I'm going to draw. It has a depth, which keeps track of the recursion because I don't want to end up in infinite recursion. So the depth is the current depth that I'm at. Then the max depth is how many times I want to iterate. And then n branch is the number of branches that a tree can have at the end of each of the of the of the of the lines, right? Because if you would draw a tree, or at least if I draw a tree, and then the thing that I do is I just do something like this, right? So I make a single line, and then I do like this, 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 and then every time the branches go and they they kind of branch out, 
and then sometimes I have a little bit more branches, sometimes a little bit less. Right? And this doesn't really start to look like a tree, but if you do this a hundred thousand times, then it starts becoming a really, really nice nifty tree. So that's what the thing does. So the thing is that if if I'm not at the maximum depth, right? So if I'm not not if I haven't recursed enough, I have to do something. So I take my start position and then I do some sine cosine calculations and calculate the end position. I'm going to make a line coloring because I want my tree to look pretty, right? So I want to the, the top branches should be green and the, the trunk itself should be brown. Um, so if the depth is larger, then I set the color to brown and otherwise I take like a greenish color, but the greenish color again is kind of a random number that I take so that it doesn't look too green and it has a little bit of yellow in there as well. And then I just say make a line. So draw a line from the start position to the end position that I calculated using the line color, using the line width that I selected. And then I'm going to do for each of the branches, just call my draw tree function again, but now the end position, right? So the end position is now the start position. And that is the way that this works. Um, and, and this is a really fun function that you can make at home and that you can spend a lot of time on. But I'm just going to show you guys how it looks because um, it, I think it looks really, really nifty. So let's just throw in the function using the default parameters. Um, so it will open up a window and then it will start drawing a nice little tree. And of course, every time that I call it, it will start drawing a slightly different tree, right? And not all of them will be very pretty trees, um, but most of them will be really pretty trees. Um, and I could actually make the, the plot window a little bit smaller because like, I don't think that they will be much bigger than like 600. Um, right, so it just uses recursion and randomness to draw trees. And you can see that it draws a, a couple of, so here you see how it works. So it puts a, a single line from start to end position, and then it calls the function three times. So one time it goes here, one time it goes there, and one time it goes there. And then it recurses. And I use the sine and the cosine to make it loop around so that it doesn't only grow up, but that it can also kind of grow down. Right? And then you get these really, really nice looking trees and you can just continuously like draw different trees and sometimes they don't really work, right? This is not really how a tree works, but that, and this one goes all the way down, but it, it still looks like a nice tree. And this is something that is used in video games a lot um, because if in video game programming, um, of course, you don't want every tree in the forest to be exactly the same. But you can't have like a, a, a graphic designer make like 500 different tree models for you. So what you're going to do is you're going to use kind of a standard model that you have and then you're going to randomly change like little things so that every tree has a little bit of a uniqueness in there. Um, and these are, these are all fractal trees. So they're all fractals and they all look like really, really nice. And some of them actually fail like hard um, and some of them will actually grow down because like I haven't put any restrictions on that the tree cannot go into the ground. Um, but this is kind of how I do it. And every time you get a really, really nice looking tree um, based on the colors. And, and sometimes it's kind of close to a real tree, but sometimes it's, it's, it's not even a tree to speak of. This is more of a bush, not really a tree, because you can see that here the, the thing actually hits lower than the branch. Nice, eh? So you can do really pretty stuff with R, right? And it, it doesn't have to be a green tree, right? Like we could be on a different planet and we could say, well, um, I want to have a blue tree, right? And then we just say, well, we change the random color selection. So instead of drawing a, a G, a green color, we're going to draw a blue color. And now all of a sudden we have like a, a kind of alien looking tree. Yeah, or it could be a tree that's blooming and has different kinds of colors. Right, so and uh, the the code is is relatively flexible because I could make the tree bigger, I could make it smaller, I could recurse more to make it more dense, I could recurse less to make it less dense. Um, yeah, but in the end, uh, it 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 always kind of looks like a tree, and it's kind of a fractal tree structure, and it looks pretty okay. Good. So the code for that, um, you you can see it here. Um, Right, so you can see the code here. The code is also um, going to be here in Notepad. Um, there's some sine and cosine things, but this is just mathematics, right? I think that everyone in high school learned that if you do like trigonometry, hey, that if you have the sine, that that's like if you have a circle, then the sine is the, the thing like that. And but 
it's just something that you have to experiment with, right? And I also have the basic code for the basic tree, um, which doesn't look as pretty as the as the other tree, um, but it it has kind of all of the elements, right? And this, of course, is the very basic tree because you start and it only recurses once. Right, and you could recurse more um, because we can say, well, do a depth of three, um, and then it will make the same tree, but now add a little bit to it. So I have to reset the plot window, and I could just say, well, recurse three times, right? But now you can see what's starting to happen. So we draw a single line, and then from the from the end point of the line, we draw three new lines, and then we start drawing three or four m more lines. Um, and of course, this is just because we are using. Uh, run if to do random functions um, and of course we can recurse even more so we could recurse not three times but we could recurse like ten times um, and then the tree starts to become relatively complex and then you see that it also starts growing up and like things start overlapping a lot but you get kind of a, a, a tree-ish structure oh damn you guys you're looking at the wrong window tell me that you're not able to see the window when I'm doing like really nice trees Right, and this of course starts becoming really heavy because every time we hit the recursion it will hit the recursion a couple of times. Um, so just to let you show how this works, so if we draw the tree using two depth and we do one line and then we call the same function three times every time calculating a random new endpoint from where we started, um, we could do the same thing and then recurse three times if we recurse three times, then it starts more or less looking like this. So we have the first line, then we call the function three times, and then for each of the endpoints, we call the function again three times. So recursion is a very good way of creating like random objects for games or making fractals, um, which look really nifty. So recursion is something that is really, really useful. Um, and generates it generates something in very small amount of code all right so that's that's it for for um, now so we will have a short break and then we will start the lecture um, the lecture today let me show you the PowerPoint so the lecture going today is going to be me teaching you guys how to make an R package um, so hey imagine that you have a really nice way of generating all kinds of random trees and you want to give that to other people Right, so our packages are packages that we've been using, um, like um, some of the libraries, like the, um, the library for normalization. And so imagine that in the future, you write some code to analyze your own data, for example, during your PhD. Then of course you are going to publish the results of your research, but you might also want to publish your code so that other people can use your code and you are not just getting cited for the results that you obtain, but that you're also getting cited for the software that you created. So that is why designing R packages is a really nice thing to be able to do. Um, I actually got a lot of, not so much citations out of it, but I, a lot of collaboration um, because a lot of people don't know how to make R packages. So they can program in R, they can write really, really complex algorithms, but then they don't know how to create an R package out of it. So then they ask me and I say, sure, I can make an R package out of it. And then I, I work for like a day um, to take their code and adjust it so that it can be in an R package. And then I'm co-author on their publication. So I'm somewhere in the middle of the author list. Um, so it's a really nice way to get co-authorships, to be able to make an R package. Um, because a lot of people, they are very good in mathematics or they're very good in statistics, but they're not that good in creating R packages. But for now, um, I'm going to say we're going to take a break. I'm going to get some more water and cool off a little bit. So we'll stop.